Due to mature themes, parental guidance is advised for the following program. It is one of Philippines' most sensational stories. It was the trial of the century. <laughs> Three women brutally murdered. It must be a maniac who, who committed that kind of killing. Eight young men from influential families are identified by a star witness as conspirators to the crime and sentenced to life imprisonment. It isn't us. Is it me? It was a testimony of a drug addict. Lana, Lana, katarungan dit sa ating bansa. Fifteen years later, in an incredible story of justice versus lies, the Visconda massacre continues to captivate a country desperate for the truth. BF Homes Paranaque is a quiet and secluded suburb 20 minutes drive south of Manila. The carefully planned village, with wide open spaces, is home to 12,000 middle and upper class households. All movement in and out of the village is closely monitored by armed security guards. But on the morning of June 30, 1991, Residents of this exclusive community wake up to shocking news. A mother and her two daughters are found brutally stabbed to death in the bedroom of their bungalow. They are identified as Estrelita, Carmela, and Jennifer Visconda. Rodel Visconda, a close relative of the victims, recalls rushing to the scene within an hour of the gruesome discovery. Si Carmela nasa floor, si Jennifer nasa kama besides uh, her mom na nandoon na nakatali rito and during that time si Carmela meron pang pasak na punda ng unan. The murders were brutal. Rodel's aunt, 47-year-old Estrelita, had been stabbed over 12 times. Her 18-year-old daughter Carmela was raped and stabbed nine times. Most shockingly, 7-year-old Anna Marie Jennifer was found murdered with 19 stab wounds. Gerardo Biong, the first police investigator on the scene, remembers the carnage and intensity of the crime. Abay, brutal. Tatatlo ba naman na mag-iin at saka bata yung isa eh. Makita kung duguan eh. Hindi pangkaraniwan yung bata. Napasigaw nga ako rin sa totoo lang eh. Kako mahuli lang kita. Ah, kung pwede kitang lunokin, lulunokin kita. The police immediately begin investigations. The husband and father of the murdered girls is in the United States, and there are no witnesses to the crime. Fingerprints and photographs are taken from the crime scene. Satisfied with the investigation, police inspector Biong gives family relatives permission to clean up what turns out to be vital evidence. So on that day, Sunday, pagkatapos namin nagkuha ng fingerprint, doon na nagsabi na, oh ano, pwede na kami maglinis. Kako eh, pwede na, tapos na kami. Kamuhay na kami. Kasi daw nangangamoy. Tito Mar doesn't know naman. Hindi pala kailangan sunugin yung mga ganun. Hindi pala linisin. Dapat uh, i-preserve mo yung crime scene. Uh, ito nga ang na nagpresenta na. Sige, I'll, I'll join you. Mm -hmm. eh, parang doon sinamahan niya si Tito Mar. Siya yung pumili ng mga dapat na sunugin during the time. We were not talking that much about DNA. But unfortunately, that was not an option. Because the laboratories at the time could not do it. But you make the most of what you've got. And that means, once you decide to burn it, that means you've given up, have you exhausted everything, or you don't care. Epimaco Velasco, an officer from the National Bureau of Investigation, is assigned to the case. With so much vital evidence destroyed, he is forced to focus on the murdered family's background. 
but there are few clues to explain why the Visconda women were murdered with such ferocity. It was doubly difficult for us to reconstruct the events. Nobody would do that. Manibawa, nagalit ka lang, revenge, out of revenge. We'll commit such uh, uh, unspeakable brutality. Eh? Most baffling for Velasco is motive. The Viscondas were not especially wealthy and had no known enemies. They mga babae yun eh. Wala naman dahilan para kwan, eh, to pick up on the Visconde. Hindi naman masyadong sikat na sila Visconde at that time. The family was very close. The murdered children, Jennifer and Carmela, were ordinary loving kids who doted on each other. Seven-year-old Jennifer in particular was very protective about her older sister. Napaka-sweet nung bata and talagang makaating makaate. Don't say something na bad against the ate and siya ang unang-una mong alam mo, oh, your ate is pangit, your ate is masungit. Ah, no, 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 ganyan. Two days after the murder, father and husband Lauro Visconda returns home. At first, he is spared details of his family's slaughter. Every time na may media na dumarating sa wake, sinasabi namin, please don't give him the details yet. What happened? When Laura Visconda finally discovers the details of what happened to his family, he is traumatized. Hanggang sa mailibing kasi si Carmela, silang tatlo, Tito doesn't know the exact situation, what happened, until immediately after ng libing, nagkaroon ng meeting ang family. Sakto, nagkakaroon ng news during that time and uh, sinabi doon na Carmela was raped labing tatlo yung saksak ni tita Jennifer the youngest was stabbed 18 times saka lang sinabi niya sa akin hindi mo sinabi sa akin ni rape pa pala yung anak ko as the details of the grisly murders filter through to the public via the press The police find themselves under increasing pressure to solve the crimes, and fast. But it takes three and a half months before the police announce a breakthrough. They get a tip-off that a group of renowned house burglars are behind the Vesconda slayings. They pursue the lead and arrest six men. The six men, all notorious criminals from the Akyat Bahai gang, confess to the murder of Estrelita and Jennifer, and the rape and killing of Carmela Visconda. They admit also that after the murders, they fled the crime scene with cash and jewelry worth 140,000 pesos. The police validate the confessions by announcing they have retrieved the stolen goods from pawn shops and declare the case closed. But the surviving Viscondas are not convinced. Many details and the alleged confessions do not match up with the facts. Nagsalita sa amin, sabi ganun, eh, pinatay ho talaga namin yung mag-iinan ninyo eh. Sa nyo dinala? Doon po sa second floor ninyo. Sabi namin, second floor, eh, bunggalo lang yung bahay eh, walang second floor. Yung isa naman, sinabi namin, o, oh, paano nangyari? Ang sagot sa amin, eh, palabas na ho kami eh, hinabulo kami ng aso. Dali, wala na kami aso eh. So, yun yung... Despite confessing to the murders, the suspects then completely retract their statements, telling the awaiting press that they were tortured into making a confession. All charges are dropped. Over the next two years, the NBI follows several new leads and picks up a number of suspects for the Visconda slaying, but none of the charges stick. We pursue our own investigation. We interviewed the uh, witnesses. We invited uh, so many witnesses. But the case seems to be at a complete standstill. Then the NBI gets a new break. They hear rumors that the Visconda killings may have been committed not by ordinary thieves, but by drug-crazed adolescents. Uh, no one in his right mind Unless uh, there was some important reason why he will so violent, he will be under kind of rage, uh, he will do that. 
I could, I forbid that to, to drug. And these murderers weren't ordinary kids. They came, it is said, from prominent families. Very suspicious, a son of a prominent politician was the one involved because uh, unfortunately, very uh, shocking reputation that he was using drugs. Tapping into rumors from the grapevine, they hear of a completely different set of suspects. Spoiled brats, uh, kids uh, in drugs, uh, having a, a party, and then uh, during uh, at the, 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 the height of their, of, their, of their height, they went to uh, this uh, a, a household and then massacred the occupants. To begin with, the rumors are vague unfocused. But then a name catches the National Bureau of Investigation's attention, and it's one they know well. 27-year-old Hubert Webb, son of Paranaque Congressman Freddy. Manila is a small town. Everybody uh, practically knows everybody else uh, in, in, a, in, in prominent circles. Hubert, on account of his uh, being uh, a politician's son and his being a sort of a spoiled brat was known, was notorious in his village because uh, there were talks that uh, he used drugs. It doesn't take long for the press to pick up on the rumors about Hubert and the notorious Visconda killings. Hubert's father, Freddie, remembers when he first heard his son might be a suspect. We came back here in the Philippines from the United States um, we were having dinner, and one of my sons, I can't remember who, said, uh, Dad, would you believe that uh, there is a, a, uh, a gossip that uh, one of your sons is involved with this Visconde massacre, no? And, uh, you know, we considered it like, like, you know, like a laughing matter, no? Because uh, one of my sons, so I, I was saying, you know, knowing my sons, uh, they're not capable of doing something like this. But the National Bureau of Investigation takes the rumors about Hubert Webb's involvement in the killing very seriously. They bring two house helpers who were living and working at the Visconda residence when the massacre occurred to Congressman Freddie Webb's house. The NBI agents are hoping that they can identify Hubert at the crime scene. They went to the house and uh, told me, can I have the two maids of the Visconde enter here just to see and identify if indeed any of your son is involved in the Visconde massacre. Please do. So the two maids enter. I show them the picture of Michael, my son, and I show the picture of Hubert. Now, the maids look at it, and then they said no, no. They, they were saying no, no. Hubert's father is now very concerned and calls the head of the NBI, Alfredo Lem, to offer his cooperation. And I told him, uh, Mayor, there is a, uh, a gossip going around that uh, my, one of my son, particularly Hubert Webb now, is being identified as the, uh, one of the people involved in the massacre of the Visconde family. I told him, he's now in the States. Uh, do you want him to come home? so that, you know, you can ask him questions and maybe fingerprint him and all of that stuff. And these are the exact words of Mayor Lim. It's a gossip. We don't have to even bother about it. The NBI is already aware of Hubert's whereabouts and requests the FBI to quietly look into Hubert Webb's activities in the U.S. FBI legal attache in Manila, Robert Hefner, recalls how the evidence appeared to back Congressman Webb's claims. Our initial inquiry uh, first verified the fact that he was in the U.S. and we verified this through U.S. immigration uh, and also separately through U.S. Customs Service. We verified the fact of when he obtained a California driver's license which had his photo and thumbprint on it and uh, a residence uh, where he was staying in California at the time. Convinced of the FBI findings, the Bureau clears the name of the congressman's son during a congressional investigation into the Visconda slayings. I knew this case wasn't going to go anywhere because he was in the States. If you are to talk to Mayor Lim, he's going to tell you. 
even Epi Velasco, they're going to tell you that the people that did this certainly was not Hubert Webb because they double checked on his, his, his all of his credentials from his passport to his ticket to his uh, passenger manifest to his visa to his entrance in and out of the United States. So they, they, they know he was there. Plus the FBI report. Do not forget the FBI report because that's very vital. The NBI looks elsewhere for the murderers. Marami kaming kinuwestyon ng mga laborers. Hundreds of them. We we invited them to the NBI. We subjected them to polygraph and uh, intense interrogation. Pero nothing came out of it, unfortunately. Hungry for justice, Manila journalists increased their pressure on the Philippine government to get results. Then, four years after the notorious slayings, the NBI announces an astonishing breakthrough. It was just um, supposedly a, a gang rape. They say that a new witness has come forward with a startling allegation that several members from some of Manila's most elite families conspired to rape Carmela Visconda, then kill the rest of the family to conceal their crime. The witness's name is Jessica Alfaro. Did you witness the rape or the killing? Yes. Alfaro, in a shocking statement to the press, fingers Hubert Webb as the mastermind behind the Visconda murders. She claims that he had seven accomplices, all from wealthy families. Among them, Antonio Tony Boy Lejano, son of movie actress Pinky De Leon, Michael Gachalian, and Miguel Rodriguez, sons of prominent lawyers, Peter Estrada, son of a wealthy businessman, Pike Fernandez, son of a retired admiral, Joey Fielert, an alleged relative of a police general, and Don Ventura, son of a businessman. In an explanation as to why she didn't come forward earlier, Alfaro confesses that she herself has a history of drug addiction. First, because I was scared. Shepherd, I was scared. At the, at the same time, I outlet to cover up which is that. And then, thirdly, I forgot about the entire You forgot? Yeah, because of the outlet I she alleges that Hubert and the murder gang were high on drugs when they slaughtered the Viscondas. And then Jessica Alfaro makes one final shocking claim. She says that the first police investigator, Gerardo Bion, who had authorized the cleanup of the Visconda house, was in on the crime. The spotlight is back on Hubert Webb and his unknown accomplices. Pressed for details, Alfaro reveals what happened the night of the murders. In a sworn statement to the NBI, Alfaro recounts that the night started off in a car park where she, together with Webb and the rest of his gang, used crystal meth, a low-end version of crack cocaine. Hubert Webb then asked Alfaro and her boyfriend Estrada to check on the Visconda residence. He was particularly interested in arranging a clandestine meeting with the elder daughter, Carmela Visconda. Alfaro claims to have visited the Visconda residence three times that evening. On her return from the second visit, she recalls chancing upon Carmela driving and dropping off a man along the main thoroughfare. She tells Webb what she saw. She also tells Webb that Carmela had a message for him. Drop by the Visconda residence before midnight and she will leave the gate open. She says that Carmela Visconda advised them to blink their headlights twice to signal their arrival. Alfaro then says she overheard Webb saying, we will take turns in raping Carmela, but I will be the first one. 
The gang proceeds to the Visconda residence. As promised, the gate is open. Alfaro enters the house first, followed by Webb, Bahano, and Ventura. The five others stay outside as lookouts. Alfaro says Carmela was waiting for them in the kitchen. Seeing Hubert Webb follow Carmela inside the house, Alfaro decides to step outside for a smoke. From the corner of her eye, she sees Ventura getting something from the kitchen drawer. Alfaro goes back into the kitchen and peeps through the bedroom door. She sees the bloodied bodies of Estrelita and Jennifer on top of the bed and notices the television is on full blast. Seconds later, Alfaro sees Webb on top of Carmela, who is gagged and in tears. Carmela's first cousin, Rodel Visconda, is convinced by Alfaro's testimony. Instinct na lang yata eh, pero alam namin nagsasabi ito ng totoo eh. Kapag kaka-describe niya nung lahat ng pangyayari, match na match doon sa nakita namin doon sa lugar, sa, sa physical evidence, doon sa crime scene. Yeah, and hindi mo madidetalyado eh. The testimony of Alfaro is the break that the NBI had been waiting for. Charges of rape with homicide are immediately filed against Hubert Webb and his seven friends. The court issues a warrant for the gang's arrest. Six of the eight suspects, Webb, Lejano, Gachalian, Fernandez, Estrada, and Rodriguez, surrender to the police. Two of the gang members are nowhere to be found. The media goes into a frenzy as six suspects connected to some of the Philippines' most influential families make their way to the court hearings. The case gets dubbed the Visconda Massacre. All the accused vehemently deny the allegations. They say they do not even know one another. Most notably, Hubert's father, by then already a senator, swears it was impossible for Hubert to be involved because he was in the States at the time of the murders. I was in the States at the time. I arrived on June 28, 1991, precisely to visit Hubert, which I have not seen for more than three months because he arrived there on uh, March 10, 1991. And uh, the reason why we went there was to finally see him and see how he's doing. Because at that time, uh, he already was able to get a job. And uh, he was happy, you know, being independent. I was in the States. I had left March 9. And the reason I remember these things is because of the case. Since something this terrible happened, it sort of left a mark. Hubert insists repeatedly that he was not in the Philippines at the time of the murders. He had landed, he says, a very good job in the U.S. Webb swears that he does not know and has never even met Carmela Visconda or the eyewitness, Jessica Alfaro. Only one of the accused, Peter Estrada, claims to know Alfaro, as he was an ex-boyfriend. The rest of the accused all say they do not know the eyewitness. Charged with a heinous crime, they are detained in a police camp and later transferred to the Paranaque City Jail. We really don't have a clue. I met the rest of the people involved. I had spoken to them and asked them, do you have anything to do with this? We were all, at first we were all not sure about each other. Newly appointed NBI chief, Mariano Misson, under instructions from President Ramos to solve the Visconda murders, gets a big lift from an anonymous caller. This is the first day I'm going to take over as, as uh, director. And by about 11 or 11.30 of that day, an anonymous call was received by me in Visayan dialect. Sir, katong usang testigo niya sa web case, din hi sa antipolo. In an intriguing testimony, two former household helpers of the webs inform Misan that both Hubert and his father, Freddy, were in the Philippines when the Visconda murders happened. 
laundry woman Mila Gaviola claims to have washed the blood-stained T-shirt of Hubert Webb. In the course of my investigation, we were able to get it to housemates. Ang sinasabi ng warang isag-isag, eh, alam mo naman niya yung housemate, kung ano lang sabi ng NBI. Eh, it's not true. Bakit ang mga maid ba hindi marunong magsalita ng totoo? Yeah, the director, Mr. Ron, and assistant director. Then, even more information, corroborating Alfaro's account, comes to the surface. Uh, matter of fact, one of the witnesses I talked to was a, a ramp model who was with that group of web on the night that it happened. But of course, he refused to make statements. I mean, sir, paano naman ang buhay ko? How did this take care? With the evidence stacking up against Webb and his accomplices, the NBI needs to get the testimonies heard in court to make sure Webb is convicted. But it is not easy. The NBI tries approaching Webb's alleged accomplices, Fernandez and Estrada, to try and persuade them to testify as state witness against Webb. They refuse. So too does Gerardo Biong, the policeman who may have cleaned up after the gang's rampage. Pag gusto nila mangyari, kung ano yung salita ng Jessica, ayunan ko. Magkaroon ng corroboration para maging matibay ang kanilang uh, alukuhan na mag, uh, mapostro ka agad ng kaso. May hindi ko magagawin. Wala namang katotohanan. Hiring top caliber lawyers, the Webs are assured that Hubert will be released, as the evidence that he was in the United States is overwhelming. We had said that any evidence we present, a single one, that if you can find to be tampering, it's fake, no, we would gladly walk here already. He said he would walk back to jail. We were all confident that we, I would be out in by Christmas. But the confidence would be short-lived. The most awaited marathon court hearings start in October 1995. Tension grips the court on the day Alfaro comes face to face with the accused Hubert Webb and the rest of the gang. Prosecution eyewitness Jessica Alfaro sticks to her story and pens Hubert Webb to the scene of the crime as the mastermind of the murders. Two former household helpers of the Webbs, Nerissa Rosales and Mila Gaviola, also confirm that Hubert, as well as his father Freddy, were in Manila at the time of the murders. Rosales remembers serving juice to Hubert and two other friends on the eve of the crime. Mila Gaviola, the laundry woman of the Webb family, says she washed Hubert's bloodied t-shirt on June 30, 1991. She claims also to have seen her master, Senator Freddie Webb, in the early morning of June 30, 1991, reading the newspaper. Case number 95-404. The people of the Philippines versus Hubert G.P. Webb and Arnold. Finally, it's the turn of the Webb's attorney to somehow repair the damage. He calls prime suspect Hubert Webb to the stand, who sticks to his alibi and submits documentary evidence that he left the Philippines for the United States on March 9, 1991, and came back almost 19 months later on October 26, 1992. His father, Freddie Webb, shows stamps in his passport proving he was also in the U.S. on the night of the crime. The defense then make their move to discredit the state witness, Jessica Alfaro, and start demolishing Alfaro's credibility by looking into her personal background. It's not really a question of numbers. If you have a sole witness who is credible, he or she can really defeat the testimony of a dozen others. But uh, in this particular case, I think the sole witness was lying through her teeth. The defense says that Alfaro was being fed the information by the National Bureau of Investigation, or NBI, and that she hadn't witnessed the murders at all. 
the NBI is the investigating agency, the functional equivalent of the FBI. They were the ones who really manufactured the case. I wish I could uh, use a milder term for fabricating, but uh, no matter how you <laughs> cut it, it comes down to that. It was a testimony of a drug addict who used and were strained to adopt the version of an earlier group of suspects. And they trained Jessica to mouth or repeat the same. Sagisag's theory is supported by John Hera, the first security escort assigned to guard Jessica Alfaro during the trial. Hindi ko alam kung sino yung nakaka-rehearse niya eh. Mas nalalaman ko lang na nagre-rehearse lagi. Before, bago mag hearing So, kung nagre-rehearse, ibig sabihin, uh, they're into something already. Supporting their seemingly outrageous statement, the defense cites an earlier confession from Alfaro that differs from the sworn statement being used as evidence in court. In her first signed confession to the NBI in April 1995, Alfaro said that she only heard and did not actually witness the crime. She learned of what happened inside the house during a blaming session right after the group left the Visconda residence. In open court, it is revealed that Alfaro is not just an ordinary witness. She is a longtime informer of the NBI who supplies information about drug pushers and other criminal elements. Hubert Webb's lawyers then focus on a key discrepancy in Alfaro's story, her claim to have witnessed the crimes by peeping from a bedroom door that was left ajar. The defense calls on the Visconda's domestic helper, Belen Domantita, who knows the bedroom's layout and tells the court that it was improbable that Alfaro could have seen what she claims. Lawyer Zenaida Accorda was with the prosecution and defense panels during a visual inspection of the Visconda residence before the start of the trial. When you open the door, you cannot see the bed. You cannot possibly see what Jessica said she saw in her affidavit. Alfaro revises her story in court. She says she did actually step inside the bedroom when she could not see anything from peeping through the slightly open door. We demonstrated that when you open the door, you could not have seen what she said she saw. That is why during the court testimony, she changed her version. But Judge Amelita Tolentino accepts Alfaro's explanation of the discrepancies in her two sworn statements. The trial judge prevented the defense from cross-examining Jessica on the first affidavit. With Jessica Alfaro's testimonies upheld by the court, the defense turns to the accusation that Webb was in Manila at the time of the killings. The FBI turns over to the court a number of documents upon the request of the Philippine government. It verifies Webb's alibi through the accused's travel records with the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service, or INS. Manila journalist Ramon Tulfo confirmed that Hubert was, according to the evidence, in the U.S. I interviewed uh, the family that Hubert stayed in, his uncle, uh, his aunt, and then neighbors. But the, the big one was the owner of the bicycle shop where Hubert Webb bought uh, his bicycle on June 30, 1991. Despite the documentary evidence, the NBI and the prosecution panel continue to insist that Webb was in Manila at the time of the murders. They say that although he is confirmed as having left Manila for the U.S. in March 1991, he could have returned to the Philippines, committed the murder, and sneaked back to the United States without being detected any time after that. But Webb is able to present certifications from U.S. and Philippine government officials 
that after arriving in America on March 9, 1991, he never left the United States until after October 1992. There was this computer printout, which printed the dates of entry and dates of departure. And it was clearly stated there, date of entry, March 9, 1991, date of departure, October 26, 1992. No other record of any entry or departure in between. And these are certifications issued by no less than Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State Warren Christopher, U.S. Attorney General Janet Reno, and the Office of Commissioner Andrea Domingo of the Philippines. Even the FBI's Robert Hefner says the scenario painted by the NBI and the prosecution is highly unlikely. It would be very difficult to fake uh, documents such as U.S. immigration records, U.S. custom records that we obtained. I would say it would really be impossible for someone who's in the U.S. to, uh, who's there legally in the U.S. In other words, he arrived, his passport is stamped through immigration. It would be very uh, difficult, if not impossible, for that person to leave and then come back in the U.S. without going through that same process. The NBI's Misson vehemently disagrees. Because he doesn't know what's happening in our immigration. They just go by the record. But it is, well, practically common knowledge. You want to leave the country, you want to stamp on it. Lalo yung mga nag-immigrant-immigrant, palalabas siya na lumabas, na hindi naman. To back up Hubert's alibi, the Webbs request the FBI attaché to testify in court about the FBI findings. But the U.S. government turns down the bid. On many type of cases, uh, different governments will not allow diplomats to testify. Not one, in other words, it's strictly a, a, a domestic uh, matter. Being in the Philippines in a diplomatic position, uh, the U.S. government uh, would not let me testify at that time. The other five imprisoned murder suspects had their own alibis, detailing where they were and what they were doing at the time the crime happened. But aside from Webb, only Lejano took the witness stand. Estrada did not even present any evidence to prove his innocence. Incredibly, all the accused adopted the evidence and relied on the alibi and denials of Hubert Webb. It's a matter of legal strategy. Whatever uh, evidence is presented in court, you can actually adopt as your own evidence. It's been all for one, one for all. As the spotlight is on the court battle between the prosecution and the Webbs, the manhunt for the two other accused who are at large, Joey Fielert and Dong Ventura, quietly takes the back seat. Nag-disappear na lang sa record eh, wala na eh. Because wala naman sila mabanggit na talagang specific uh, act na ginawa eh. It was just mentioned in the course, uh, kasama rin, somewhere in what occasion. With the prosecution contesting Hubert's alibi every step of the way, and clearly enjoying the upper hand, the defense comes up with another plan. Webb's lawyers petitioned the court to order a DNA test on the vaginal smear taken from the corpse of Carmela Visconda during the autopsy. They argue that if the sperm specimen in the vaginal smear does not belong to Hubert, then it proves that he did not rape Carmela as claimed by Alfaro. But Lady Judge Tolentino junks Webb's petition. She says the technology for DNA testing is not available in the country, and more importantly, not yet accepted as evidence in Philippine courts. The judge also cites the possibility of the vaginal smear being contaminated because of the frequent and long brownouts that hit the country in the early 1990s. In the course of the trial, Judge Tolentino rejects 132 of the 142 pieces of evidence submitted by the Webbs. Despite the daily hearings, the trial lasts two and a half years. Judge Tolentino hears the testimonies of 102 witnesses, seven for the prosecution and 95 for the defense. 
Eight lawyers representing all the accused take turns in grilling prosecution witnesses, particularly Alfaro. The petitions and motions for reconsideration filed by the defense before the lower court, Court of Appeals, and the Supreme Court adds to the delay. In November 1999, and with time running out, the Webs ask for the testimonies of five more witnesses who are working in the U.S. to be taken into consideration as evidence that Hubert was not in Manila at the time of the murders. The Supreme Court denies, with finality, the motion of the Webs. We, uh, expect to move that After almost five years since the trial began, Judge Tolentino finally makes her decision. January 6, 2000, nine years after the murder of the Visconda family, hundreds of people cram their way to the Paranaque Regional Trial Court to await the verdict of the six sons of rich and influential families charged with homicide with rape. All eyes are on the lone judge, Amelita Tolentino. Television and radio stations cover the event live. The people of the Philippines, let us refer to the people of the homicide. At 8.30 a.m., the clerk of court starts reading the 186-page decision. Well, for this court find, hereby finds all the principal accused guilty beyond the sort of doubt of the crime of rape with homicide and hereby sentences each of them to suffer the penalty of reclusion perpetual. Judge Tolentino sentences life imprisonment to Hubert Webb, Peter Estrada, Aspicio Fernandez, Michael Gachalian, Antonio Lajano II, and Miguel Rodriguez. This court likewise finds the accused Gerardo Bion guilty beyond reasonable doubt as an accessory. The court sentences police investigator Gerardo Bion to 11 years in prison as an accessory to cover up the crime by destroying vital crime scene evidence. Wala po akong pinagsisiyan eh. Kasi malamang din naman kung halimbawa ako ay uh, nagbaon ng mga tao na hindi naman totoo, baka ang karma noon mas maaga, baka napatayin na ako. As he listens to the verdict, Webb drops the usual brave front and sobs. In the public gallery, the parents and siblings of all the accused are overwhelmed with emotion. We knew we were going to get hit already because we, we saw how it was going. It was really one-sided. If you can look at the transcripts, we never won an objection. We'd probably win one out of ten. They would win ten, we'd win one. We have all real. Widower Lauro Visconda is overjoyed. But aware that the accused will contest the decision all the way to the Supreme Court, he expresses relief for the partially gained justice for his murdered wife and two daughters. In making her decision, Judge Tolentino sides with the testimony of the eyewitness. She is not convinced with Webb's alibi because she finds the sworn statements and testimonies of defense witnesses full of inconsistencies. The judge says the photographs and videotapes of Webb frolicking in the snow in the United States appear to be tampered. The court ignores the documents from the FBI and the U.S. State Department because the American signatories of evidence submitted by Webb did not testify in court about the authenticity and accuracy of its contents. The judge also dismisses the letters of the FBI legal attaché to the NBI that substantiate Webb's claim that he was in the United States between March 1991 to October 1992. She says Hefner, who is based at the U.S. Embassy in Manila, does not have first-hand information about Webb's whereabouts at the time of the murders. Hefner and the then U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright also did not testify in court. We at the U.S. Embassy thought it was very unusual, though, that documentation which was provided to the Philippine government as authenticated uh, would not be accepted uh, as a documentation. Uh, but then again, this we have to go by the Philippine law and what the rules and regulations are here, where uh, a secretary of state of a foreign country would have to personally appear. 
In summing up her decision, Judge Tolentino highlights that the power and the money at the disposal of the webs meant they could have come up with all the evidence and witnesses necessary to defend the accused Hubert. Quoting from a Supreme Court ruling, she says, truth is established not by the number of witnesses, but by the quality of their testimonies. Actually, the norm is to look for witnesses. And uh, the so-called eyewitness is the best. And that is because, that's it, we don't know much about the value of physical evidence. That's why there's nothing left. We take the easy way out. Was there anybody who saw the incident? And then you look for a face to match the sketch. And once you have that, and you have a witness pointing a finger and saying, oh yes, that's him, I saw him. Even if he's wrong, this witness is wrong. Uh, people lie, by the way. People make mistakes. People could be paid to say anything. The Webbs appealed the lower court decision. But in 2005, the Court of Appeals upholds the ruling of Judge Tolentino, 3-2. to two. The Visconda Massacre case now goes to the Supreme Court for automatic review. Despite losing their appeals, the Webbs swear by Hubert's innocence. They elevate to the Supreme Court Hubert's appeal for a DNA analysis, even volunteering to pay for it. Consulted by the webs on DNA testing, Dr. Raquel Fortune, a renowned forensic pathologist, believes DNA analysis could prove the guilt or innocence of Hubert Webb in the Visconda massacre case. But they're willing to pay because they're, they're serious, they're sure, it cannot have been him and therefore his DNA is not there. Thirteen years after Webb's appeal, the Supreme Court grants his request for DNA testing. But the High Court order cannot be undertaken. The vaginal smear taken from Carmela Visconda containing the DNA is missing. Both the NBI and the lower court claim that the specimen is not in their custody. The Supreme Court halts any further DNA investigations. Enraged, the Webbs filed an urgent motion to acquit Hubert because of the failure of the government to preserve vital evidence that could prove the innocence of the accused. They say Hubert was denied due process, which is grounds for an acquittal. The DNA examination would have conclusively shown that the person who had access to Carmela would have left spermatozoa in the corpse of Carmela. And that which was taken from the course of Carmela Visconde would have shown who was the one who had access and it would have shown that it was not Hubert Webb. For 15 years, Hubert's family has never failed to visit him every Sunday at the National Penitentiary where the Webbs always celebrate important occasions. Despite the many legal setbacks, the Webbs have not lost hope that Hubert would be acquitted in the end. The court will have to say that he's innocent. Well, whichever route we take, the important thing is for him to get a clean slate. Every day I'm sure he's asking himself, what am I doing here? 15 years of loss of his life, that's not, that's not easy. Even Hubert believes that his freedom is only a matter of time. It will happen. Somehow it will happen. I, I think the most important thing we have to always have is hope. Even when our chips are down, as long as we have hope, there's still something to fight for. To him, the most worrisome aspect of the case is that the real killers are still on the loose. It's bothering me those crazy-minded individuals are out there and we're paying the price for their sins.
strong in me that it's just somewhere. Because it isn't us, it isn't me. December 2010, two months after backtracking from the order for DNA testing, the Supreme Court catches the whole country by surprise. Seven magistrates vote to acquit Webb and his alleged conspirators, while four justices uphold the guilty verdict of the lower courts and four others abstain in the decision-making. Hubert Webb and his fellow accused are set free. A vote of 7-4 with four justices taking no part has acquitted Hubert Jeffrey P. Webb the high court ruling says Alfaro is not an eyewitness, but an NBI informer. Hearing the good news, relatives rush to the National Penitentiary to welcome all the accused. <laughs> From his residence, Visconda receives the shocking news. He is devastated. While lawyers of Laura Visconda ask the court to reconsider its decision, Families of the accused prepare to file cases against personalities responsible for robbing 15 years from the life of their six young loved ones. Among those likely to face charges are Judge Tolentino, Jessica Alfaro, agents of the National Bureau of Investigation, and prosecutors who built and handled the case. <laughs> Kailangan namang managot. Sino bang mananagot dito? 15 years nagdusa ang anak ko. It has to happen. The facts, the truth has to be prepared in the next several weeks. The Justice Department joins the fray and announces a reinvestigation of the Visconda massacre case. Twenty years after the gruesome murders, the Visconda massacre saga continues with Jennifer, Carmela, and Estrelita Visconda still crying out for justice. <laughs> <laughs>